givers glow, call it give and glow. I'm not sure exactly what the best language game is, but boy, it's a universal truth. Uh, you know, I like to sometimes mention my very Irish mother named Molly McGee. Now that's pretty Irish. <laughs> you know. And uh, when I was a little boy growing up around age five or six, sometimes you know, I'd have a sort of a boring blue afternoon and uh, my mother, with her kitchen table wisdom, would always say, Stevie, why don't you go out and do something for someone? And I would. We lived on a little street called Oak Neck Lane, and I'd go out and help old Mr. Muller rake leaves across the street, or Bobby Lawrence work on his boat by the creek. And it always seemed to me self-evident that uh, one of the ways that we can feel best about ourselves is by contributing in small ways to the lives of the people around us. By the way, my mother, who was very Irish, uh, married my father, who was very English. And so the humor around the, the table was always something along these lines. Uh, Marguerite, what's the Irish definition of hospitality? My mother would draw a blank and my dad would say something like, you make someone feel perfectly at home while you'd be a wishing they were. <laughs> and then my mother would have a rejoinder. Uh, Henry, what, uh, why shouldn't an Irishman tell an Englishman a joke on a Saturday night? My father would say, I have no idea, Molly. And she'd say, uh, he might crack up laughing in choice the next day, <laughs> such things. So this was back and forth. It was just life at the table, you know. Uh, but I think my mother's kitchen table wisdom was just pretty much a perennial truth. And so there's nothing uh, new about this, uh, obviously. But sometimes it's important to repeat uh, uh, ideas that uh, have a lasting significance. Uh, one of my favorite passages from the wisdom literature is this one, those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. You know, it's not that uh, we help others because somehow we're at heart basely self-interested, but as an unintended byproduct of generous behavior, typically we do experience joy, we do experience greater health, and even uh, on average, although with exceptions, because obviously bad things happen to good people, uh, but on average, uh, we live even longer lives. Now that may sound pretty far-fetched, but I want to try to make the case uh, for that. You know, uh, Abraham Lincoln is such an interesting figure. Uh, a book came out recently called Lincoln's Melancholy. Melancholy is the old word for depression, if you will. Uh, he apparently had severe depression throughout most of his life. And there are remarkable stories about Lincoln, uh, for example, walking out of the White House unescorted. And he was already 6'4", and he's got a big top hat on, so he would be unmistakable. Uh, he would go down to Union Station in Washington, D.C., and uh, just arbitrarily uh, look for travelers, uh, in one case a young 13 or 14 year old girl, and help them put their big luggage pieces on the train. Uh, he was constantly doing these general actions of, 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 of helping activity. And he's famously quoted for saying, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. Uh, he was coping with his own affective disorder, if you will, through small acts of kindness. And then, of course, you know, Thoreau, uh, goodness is the only investment that never fails, or Emerson saying that anyone who sincerely helps another is also helping self. This is, is just such a part of um, uh, a good life and a common understanding. So in the hidden gifts of helping, I, you know, I tell a little story about um, coming home from a meeting in Manhattan one night late on the Long Island Railroad. 
Uh, it's a very distinctive railroad. I won't go into why, but it's, it's, it's a real New Yorker's nightmare in a way. Uh, and uh, there was a fellow on my train, just on my car, just one person named Jack. And it turns out that uh, his wife had divorced him. He um, had lost his job. He had cancer. He spent down to his 401k retirement account. And I asked him how he was coping with all this. Well, he was going to Port Jefferson, the next town down the line from Stony Brook, and he was going to spend the Christmas holidays uh, at a Presbyterian church uh, just serving soup to homeless people. And he said, uh, despite all of his peaks and valleys in life, uh, the one thing that now gave him a sense of significance and gratification and purpose in life was to help others. So I thought that was really quite compelling. Uh, another character in the book uh, 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 who I met just two years ago, Brooke Ellison, uh, had an accident as a little girl. She was 11. She became quadriplegic. Uh, she's the first quadriplegic to ever graduate from Harvard University. She graced the cover of the New York Times giving the graduation address. Uh, she uh, did a movie that Christopher Reeve uh, produced called The Brooke Ellison Story. Uh, just a world-class gal. She's now about 28. And how does she cope with living in a wheelchair? Well, she gets into a van with her wonderful mother, Jean, and she travels around uh, to uh, visit uh, young girls and boys who have had accidents and who are now wheelchair-bound and are trying to figure out how can I possibly live my life in this chair? And she works with them. She gives them her heart and her soul. And she models this kind of huge adjustment to a whole new kind of life. And this is how Brooke uh, engages uh, others, but also in the process. She finds so much joy and so much delight. Or Elisa, uh, who is my administrative assistant uh, in my center, who has uh, struggled uh, in the past with cancer. Uh, what does she do to navigate all of this? Well, she knits uh, hats and, and gloves and scarves uh, for uh, children uh, who come to the cancer center and they feel a little cold often enough uh, in these buildings. This is what she does. She helps others, and that's her, her therapy. So that's the kind of thing that I think is so common and every one of us in this room could probably um, refer to a dozen friends we know who engage in this kind of activity, which I think is just a testament to how universal it is. I was really thrilled a year ago when uh, the largest managed care uh, organization in the US, United Healthcare, came out with a scientific national study uh, based on data from 2009. So it turns out that 41% uh, of people in America were actively volunteering in various organizations. Now that's actually up a little bit from before the downturn, which is kind of intriguing, I think, uh, that people are maybe coping with the economic difficulties by getting their minds off self and contributing meaningfully to the lives of others. So in, in this particular study, it turns out the average uh, amount of volunteering per year is pretty limited. It's 100 hours a year, that's all, which comes out to, what, two hours a week. So this is low threshold volunteering. And then they ask people, well, OK, so um, how does this make you feel? 89% say that volunteering improves their sense of well-being. 73% say it lowers their stress levels. 92% it enriches their sense of pur uh, purpose. And here, this is amazing, 68% indicate that it made me physically healthier. Now, that's self-report. But actually, in the field of healthcare uh, research, self-report is taken very seriously, and it's often amazingly accurate. So here it is, you know, people are doing unto others, and in the process, uh, somewhat paradoxically, they're, they're feeling better themselves. I like to say, and I think it's a truth in all great spiritual traditions, 
that in the giving of self lies the unsought discovery of a deeper self. Now, you know, this resonates with an idea that uh, really goes back about 15 or 20 years now to Helper's High, where if individuals go out and just for a couple of hours uh, do something for others in a, in a meaningful way, uh, a little more than half of them feel a kind of euphoria that's now associated with the release of endorphins from the brain, which uh, elevate uh, uh, mood. Uh, that Many of them feel calmer uh, and less depressed. Actually, now that's associated with oxytocin, the compassion hormone. When we help others, we see a spiking in oxytocin in males and females. And interestingly, in the field of behavioral endocrinology, oxytocin is also very closely associated with feelings of tranquility or serenity or just inward peace, right? And so we're beginning to get a sense of what's going on here. Even the reduction of chronic aches and pains, and this has been duplicated a number of times. Uh, uh, again, that's due to endorphin release, which can blunt nerve endings and allow people to handle pain a little more easily. So. Um, the science on this is getting pretty interesting. About five years ago, I was invited to London. I gave testimony to a team of about 400 scientists, and this, this is called the Foresight Committee. These are the major researchers in epidemiology uh, in England. And they were trying to figure out what makes people happy across urban areas, suburbs, rural areas throughout the UK. Now, how many in this room are happy? Raise your hands. It's a pretty good group. How many could be a little happier, depending on the day? Oh, you know, okay. So, and notice, I'm not asking you explicitly what makes you happy. I won't go there. You know, we'll just do self-report subjective happiness. Um, so uh, it turns out that um, perhaps the strongest, the single strongest indicator uh, of whether a community would report happiness on the whole is the extent to which you have a rich texture of giving to neighbors and to communities. So Victor, a moment ago, uh, so rightly mentioned Robert Putnam, Bowling Alone, and now his new book, American Grace. Um, just how important it is to happiness that we have community. But it's not just community to support us community to have the opportunity to disinhibit these capacities for compassionate care. Uh, so um, very interesting stuff. Now you actually have national reports indicating just how important giving is to our happiness. Uh, now you know, when you look at the way giving functions best, I've been running around hospitals in the, in the US for four or five years working with large departments of volunteerism, because many health centers now depend heavily on volunteers. They might have four or five, six hundred volunteers that they have to organize and take care of. Well, it's really important that volunteers be doing something that they feel called to do. Uh, you don't want to put them in the wrong niche, if you will. It's also really crucial that volunteers be doing something that uses their strengths. Because that gives them the sense that they're effective as agents making a change in the world. Actually, this is quite intriguing. There are some studies showing that people who have just generic compassion have little uh, higher depression rates on average. Uh, the way to move beyond that is to find an activity focused on some particular needful constituency that you feel called toward and using your strengths make a difference. It's that sense of, of active, successful agency in the world that seems to be so important. And it's also crucial studies show uh, dealing with volunteers, whether they're older adults or uh, adolescents, uh, to pull them together, to celebrate, to share uh, experiences. And you know, final comment, this is not uh, a linear sort of phenomenon where the more volunteering you do, the happier you feel, but rather it's curvilinear, so it's a threshold effect. You do a certain amount, scientists talk about a shift effect, and then you sort of you know, have that benefit. 
Um, but again, it's just not a matter of doing more and more and more. In fact, you can overdo it. So this is a woman I, I got to know, I knew for about 25 years, uh, named Cicely Saunders. Uh, you know, she won the Templeton Prize. She was uh, uh, knighted or damed in, in the UK. Uh, she founded the hospice movement. A lot of you are familiar with the hospice movement. Uh, she actually invented the term. Uh, you know, a hospice was a place where travelers in Europe might spend the night in the medieval period. Uh, it was usually just a place to sleep, might have been, it might be attached to a convent or a monastery or what have you. And she used her analogical imagination. She said, you know, dying is a journey. So she took the word hospice and she created the world's first hospice in London. It's called St. Christopher's. I'm not going to go into how great a woman she is, but uh, in 1999 she came to MIT to a conference on empathy and altruism and she gave the dinner speech. And I was just sitting there listening to it. She said, you know, I'm 83 years old. I still go into St. Christopher's every morning. This is a very humble woman. I mean, she's, she started the hospice movement in Canada, in the US. She trained everybody. She, she's just, you know, she was great. She died several years ago. Uh, so uh, uh, she said, I still go in, and every morning I change bedpans for half an hour or an hour. And she said, you know, it's a menial task, but, but you know, it's a, it's a spiritual discipline for me. And then I sit on the ends of beds, and I just listen attentively to the stories of people who are dying. And I do that, she said, because I want them to know that they're worth listening to. And she said that uh, one of the most important needs that people have is the need to feel that their lives are significant, that their lives don't rest on just some crazy cosmic mistake, but that there's a depth and a meaning to their life. And when you listen to people, they feel loved, she said. So attentive listening, presence, being undistracted, that was all for her a tremendously important expression of compassion and love. And uh, Dame Cicely was so amazing. When, when I was around her, I always felt this combination of joy. And it wasn't just happiness. You know, happiness kind of comes and goes, and it's very dependent on external circumstances. And happiness researchers point to it as a disposition that has a genetic set point. But she had a joy, you know. Uh, it was as though she had been through so much in her life, she found a kind of inner center through giving, and it just anchored her in, 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 in a level of happiness that transcended happiness. And she was not just optimistic. Uh, uh, you know, I think, again, optimism is, is a set disposition. She was hopeful. Uh, she had this deep, fine-tuned, honed, developed sense of hope. Uh, it was really quite astonishing to be around her. Her inner freedom, uh, her gratitude for the very opportunity to serve people who were dying. Uh, Dame Cicely was unbelievable. And she's just, again, another testimony to the power of giving in, in allowing us as human beings to truly flourish. If you look at a lot of these reports on where people find joy, typically it's first and foremost in contributing to the lives of others. Uh, you know, I don't know much about the Canadian figures on this, but in 1936, American researchers at the University of Illinois first started following scientifically self-reported happiness, just like I asked you before, are you happy? And we were a little happier in 1936 than we were three years ago before the downturn. You know, that was the middle of the Depression. A third of individuals were still using outhouses, so you should go home and rip out your plumbing. No, don't do that. Don't do that. But my point is, life was simpler. People were a little happier. Uh, now we have all this material wealth per capita, but depression and uh, anxiety rates have gone up uh, tenfold. So somehow all this affluenza, uh, getting the you know, $200 pair of designer jeans at Abercrombie and Fitch is not making people any, any happier. And there's this remarkable study that came out fairly recently from the um, researchers at the NIH 
showing that if you take people off the streets, you sit them in a laboratory and you hook them up to an fMRI device that picks up areas of brain activity, you put a menu in their hands, and the menu lists things that they could contribute to, like the Dalai Lama Center. No. Um, your alma mater, your Alzheimer's Association, um, uh, your synagogue, your church, your whatever it might be. Um, and when people get a eureka moment, they check a box next to that line item on the menu, okay? And when they check the box, a part of their brain lights up that's called technically the mesolimbic pathway. And that's a very ancient part of the brain in the limbic system. It's the emotional part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that's associated with feelings of happiness and joy. And it's the part of the brain that doles out uh, what we might call feel-good chemicals like dopamine, and even now researchers are saying serotonin. So the very thing that we use often enough to try to treat depression is actually naturally elicited by even thinking about doing a generous act in a laboratory condition, right? So this begins to give us a little bit of a portrait of human nature. I've been studying happiness over the years and, and, and trying to figure it all out, and not too successfully, but uh, I do think that in the end, uh, most of the literature points to happiness <clears throat> involving a sincere concern for others, a kind of grateful simplicity, uh, an attitude of gratitude, if you will, and an ability to appreciate the simple things in life, the, the, the beauty of a sunset, uh, uh, the smell of burning fire, uh, logs on a fire, uh, simple things in life. Also, moral integrity is really important, and then a kind of nobility of purpose. I think if you look at it all, collectively, studying all that literature, those are the four key features of, of, of being happiness, of, of being happy. Um, so I have an example of, of happiness. I'll just mention this. Uh, one of my friends over the years, Sir John Templeton, who was a a major philanthropist and investor uh, who died three years ago and, and had started the Templeton Foundation. Uh, he was so remarkable. Uh, his son Jack, uh, a retired pediatric trauma surgeon, <clears throat> once told me that uh, a farmer back in uh, Tennessee, where Sir John came from originally, uh, mentioned to Jack that his father, that John Marks, he was born old. And what the farmer meant by that was that Sir John, at a very young age, was always thinking deep thoughts about themes around creativity, gratitude, uh, hopefulness, joy, spirituality. Uh, and that's really quite true. Uh, no one can put their finger on why exactly, although his mother received, I don't know if you're familiar with this, a, a magazine every month called The Daily Word. Have you ever heard of that, some of you? which comes from Unity Church in Missouri. And it's basically affirmations. An attitude of, grat of gratitude brings blessings. And then you have a little paragraph on that. Sir John loved this stuff growing up from about the age of 12 or 13. And of course, it's reflected in the Templeton Foundation, which is devoted to the study of all these kinds of spiritual um, values. Uh, simple guy. He never had a chauffeur. Uh, when I was down in Nassau once with him in about 1990 uh, in Lyford Key, there's a roundabout, and uh, he had his old uh, Rolls Royce, which he drove himself, and he drove it against the traffic because that was the shortest way to get to his office building. And all the people knew, oh, that's Sir John, and they would just, you know, drive off to the side of the roundabout. You know, it was really hilarious. But just the simplest guy, the nicest guy you could ever imagine, very humble. And a good example of, um, of I think, a joyful man. Of course, he left all of his money, uh, billions of dollars, uh, to try to ensure that going forward, uh, we would spend a lot of time not studying just deficit and disease, but really the greatest human spiritual assets. So that's Sir John. And I have to tell you, about uh, June of 2001, I was sitting in my office uh, in the uh, School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, and I got amazing facts. Now, Sir John, at that time, was 88 years old, and he did not email. You know, he, was, I, he just never got into emailing. 
but he faxed, and he faxed like crazy. Uh, no one could keep up with his faxes. So he sent me a fax, and he said, we need an institute that can study love, not, not romantic love, but you know, the love that gets people down to New Orleans after Katrina, the love that makes good, competent doctors real healers, that kind of love. So I faxed him back, Sir John, great idea, what should we call it? He returned a fax. The Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. Now I had a moment of white male trepidation, because here I am, you know, I'm in this big academic medical center, you know, and, and I think, okay, I gotta do something about this. So I faxed it back. I said, Sir John, maybe we should call it the Institute for Creative Altruism, because altruism is a little more sciencey sounding, but it's also dry and arid. And you know, we ought to be able to talk about love in the most powerful sense, and that resonates with these great spiritual traditions. So I, you know, I should be okay with that, but I was a little nervous. Well, Sir John faxed back real quickly. No, I think unlimited love, $8.9 million. And I did what I think, you know, lay down. You know, Harvey or a lot of LP, you know, a lot of you would have done, you know. Uh, um, I have to thank Tony, by the way. Where's Tony? Tony for bringing me here. <laughs> but I think Tony would have done this, too. Uh, I faxed back Sir John. I love that language. It jumps right off the page. <laughs> and we were able to support, you know, through competition, a whole lot of these studies that have looked at the benefits of giving. So, you know, there you have it. And by the way, uh, I must tell you, I was very happy writing out those checks with Sir John's money. <laughs> so I'm sure my Mesolithic pathway was just in seventh heaven, right? And one, of the, one of the studies that we funded has become very renowned. Uh, so um, there's, a, there's a research project that began on the West Coast at the University of California in Berkeley in the 1920s. And there, the, they studied 300 preteens. And a preteen in, in this category is basically a 12 year old. Um, so, researchers from Wellesley and other universities went back and looked at all this data set. And what they found out is that the one third of these 12 year olds who expressed an altruistic desire in life I want to use my talents and my gifts to help humanity, I want to do something to contribute to the lives of others. These individuals, by the way, were followed every 10 years by teams of psychologists, so they were given tests, they were uh, looked at medically, their medical records were reviewed. Uh, that one third that had this kind of generous, compassionate attitude toward life, uh, over the course of their lifetimes, their depression rates are significantly lower, they're much less susceptible to heart disease, diabetes, and asthma, and now, interestingly enough, they're in their mid to late 90s. And so two thirds of the people who are alive come from the one third of the 12 year olds who had that kind of compassionate altruistic attitude earlier in life. So this is really pretty amazing. And this book, in the course of a lifetime, came out with the University of California Press uh, several years ago. So you can understand, I was happy just trying to, you know, conjure up these projects and, 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 and help to support them and, and be able to talk with Sir John about it all. This one's really interesting. This came from, from uh, Stephanie Brown. You think about widows and widowers who have lost a loved one. Now, the three greatest stresses the psychiatric community says in life are the loss of a loved one, loss of a job, and loss of a community. Well. The thing that predicts getting through the bereavement and grief process when you lose a spouse of many years is whether you can report just, you know, significant incidences of helping others in small ways. It makes a big difference. So actually, uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, in New York there's a voluntary association of, of uh, widows and widowers and they asked me to do uh, an annual presentation at their meeting. So I, I talked with them and I brought up this particular study and there was one guy in the back who said in the tone of a New Yorker, I don't care what you say, I don't do nothing for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, you know. Well the point is, hey, what, you know, I mean, you may not get some sort of tit for tat payback, 
you may not feel that somehow there's reciprocity involved, but so what? Because on the level of internal reward, you're getting a tremendous break. So I told them that, and it didn't do much good. <laughs> Lots of studies on volunteering, and now, in fact, um, the recovery models for depression uh, that are coming out from the National Institute for Mental Health uh, in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, indicate that uh, pro-social behavior and helping others is a very important aspect of sustaining uh, recovery. A uh, really interesting study of MS patients who make just 15 minute compassionate phone calls to other people with MS, and if you follow them for two years, they have all these improvements, including lower depression. And this one I, I really like. I was involved in this, and it's one of the few things uh, that uh, I've done that's made the New York Times science section. <clears throat> but this is AA. Everybody knows AA, right? Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, you know, started by uh, Bill Wilson or Bill W. And uh, an alcoholic surgeon proctologist named Bob Smith from Akron General Hospital. So they're both alcoholics and they get together in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel in Akron in 1935. And you know, they figured something out. They figured out that they could never overcome their alcoholism if they didn't help other alcoholics. That's why an AA service is such a big piece of it. And the 12th step is to help other alcoholics specifically. But no one had ever studied this. So with Maria Pagano and some others, we got interested in it. And it turns out, here's the fact. People go dry at day one, and then they're typically in detox for four to six weeks. And then you wonder, where are they one year later? Well, the people who have fulfilled the 12th step of helping other alcoholics, and in AA there are lots of different measures for that uh, that um, have been developed. Um, and these are people who may be the greeter at the door, they may sponsor another alcoholic into AA, they may visit alcoholics in prison or in detox, they may just be making the coffee or setting out the tables and chairs for the meeting and putting them back later on. But the ones who, at a significant degree, fulfill this 12th step of serving other alcoholics have a 40% recovery rate, which is amazing. If they do all the other parts of the 12th step, you know, do a moral inventory, make apologies, where appropriate, make amends, and so forth, they have a 22% recovery rate. So the bottom line is that you double the likelihood of recovering from alcoholism in a one-year window if you help other alcoholics. That's astonishing and amazing and really important. Uh, I won't go on forever because there are so many interesting medical studies that one could cite. But suffice it to say that um, there's not much controversy that uh, older adults who involve themselves in volunteering at low thresholds or in giving tend to live longer. That's why it's not just a matter of serving older adults with meals on wheels and so forth, but actually we need to be giving them opportunities, uh, recommendations for involving themselves in service activities. In fact, in the Bay Area in San Francisco, uh, we're now experimenting with a whole movement where geriatricians across the Bay Area are involving older adults in opportunities to help others, and it seems to be pretty effective. Um, this uh, little study gets to wound healing. So it turns out that um, People who are in hostile moods, hostile emotional moods, have slower wound healing than those who are in more positive emotional moods. And one of the most positive uh, moods that seems to be good for healing, and this involves interleukin-6 uh, and the whole cytokine system, uh, are people who are heavily involved in giving. So, you know, here it is, the, the golden rule, uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. You know, uh, that's not the, mi the minimal version of the golden rule. Do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. That's not much. It means that I can come home from work one day and feel completely spiritually and morally justified because I didn't walk up behind some wanton stranger and just break their knee, <laughs> you know? That's minimalism. 
But here, you know, we're really talking about using the imagination. How can I help other people? Um, you know, it's great for other people, uh, it's, it's, it, it, but it's also tremendously important for those who are givers themselves. When I think about the moral and spiritual life, I sometimes borrow the language of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, who basically said there are two ways to live in the world. There's I it. I'm the center of the universe, and the plants revolve around me. I only relate to other people insofar as they contribute to my little agendas. Uh, if you're a psychiatrist, you call that narcissism. If you're a philosopher, you call it solipsism. If you're a theologian, you call it sin. Doesn't matter to me, you know. But then there's this emotional transformation. It's not just intellectual, but it's very emotional toward I, thou, toward discovery of the value of the other, a kind of reverence, a sense of awe and respect for the other, respect coming from the word respectara, to to look again, to look twice, uh, to value other people as ends in themselves. When we make that transformation, and that's at the heart of Buddhism and Judaism and Christianity and Hinduism, uh, it tends to be tremendously beneficial to us as agents in the world. For Buber, there's still an I, but it's a different kind of I. You know, the world is so harsh. I was um, speaking with Allison Granger Brown, uh, 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 Brown Granger. Is she here? Allison? Allison, so, hi. This afternoon. Sorry about that. <laughs> and and uh, she was saying how important it is uh, for people working in the prison system uh, to carve out time, uh, to make a very intentional effort to, uh, to be kind and generous and not to give in to all of the kind of negative pressures to become cruel and callous. I do think that intentionality is really important, uh, that we need all of us to take responsibility, no matter what our environment, to create that kind of space. I'll just tell you a little story here. It's, it's just kind of an anecdote, but it's fun. Um, maybe five or six years ago, the dean of Harvard Medical School, Joe Martin, retired. He's a neurologist of great note. And, uh, uh, he had done his residency as a young doctor under Joe Foley, another neurologist, a friend of mine. He's not, Joe is now 96. Uh, Joe Foley he lives in Cleveland Heights. So Joe invited me to <clears throat> come to Harvard with him because Joe has macular degeneration and he can't get a, around very well. So we went to this uh, retirement celebration for Joe Martin. And Joe Martin, uh, the first thing he said was, Joe Foley stand up, and old Joe Foley stood up. And Joe Martin said, the thing I'll never forget about you is that the first time you went into a patient's room and I was your student, first of all, you knocked, you paused, you walked in after you were invited in, you got down right to the eye level with the patient who had had a minor stroke, and you asked her her name, expecting an answer, even if one didn't come. And an answer did come, and then you asked her, Mrs. Johnson, is there anything I can do to make your stay in this hospital a little easier? And she was able to blurt out, yes, get me a big iced tea with lemon. And Dr. Foley went out into the hallway, and somehow he procured this iced tea. And that was the thing that Joe Martin remembered about him, you know, that he had manifested and demonstrated this kind of caring behavior. Um, in a way that was intentional, that he cultivated on a daily basis. So I'm just going to float through some final things here. Um, the way we live our lives really affects people. We have studies now that a single abrupt interaction with a doctor in a hospital raises serum cortisol levels for two days in patients. That's not very good for healing. You know, what are the, the things that overwhelm this compassionate capacity that we have, negative hierarchies. This is always a serious problem. The stress of life, the will to power, in-group, out-group tendencies, tit-for-tat thinking like that fellow who said, I don't do nothing for nothing. So we need to be aware of these and self-aware of these. What are the sources of compassion? Well, you know, they're pretty varied. Uh, there's this innate, hardwired rescue impulse. Uh, you know, my dad was 
in the Navy in 1937, and they put him in charge of building the submarine net across New York Harbor, where the Verrazano Bridge is now. It wasn't there then. And uh, one of the workers fell into the water in the winter. My dad jumped in, pulled the guy out. And I asked my dad many times, uh, Dad, why'd you do that? And he said, well, I was in the Navy, and that's what we do. But it was really just an impulse kind of a thing. It wasn't full of compassion or depth. It was something that he was trained to do uh, by habit and virtue. Um, some people, uh, Nazi uh, rescuers, uh, were rescuers in the Nazi period who took German children into their homes, uh, speak about a sense of a common humanity. That's more of a cognitive intellectual principle. Uh, empathy and compassion is one of the key sources that scientists study now, and certainly that's what we would associate with the Dalai Lama. Meditation, for some people it's a kind of sense of alignment with a higher power. There are many sources of this way of living in the world, and uh, I suppose that most of us combine them to some degree. Uh, finally, um, just a picture, uh, you know, Stephanie, uh, a, uh, an Alzheimer's clown who goes into these special care units and with a lot of uh, beautiful tone of language and a certain kind of facial expression uh, and the use of touch, you know, she connects in a tender way with deeply forgetful individuals. And, and the Alzheimer's clown movement has been very successful in kind of bringing people out of themselves. And I was impressed, she actually sings with these individuals. Uh, there's a lot of neuroscience now pointing out that when you sing a song that a person will remember perhaps from their generational cohort, they typically can chime in for a few verses. Final point, you know, um, a lot of us grew up thinking that um, Darwin was all about me versus you for some desired object in the environment that we're competing for. But the later Darwin, the Darwin who really became much more open to the importance of sympathy and altruism and compassion in our lives, you know, he said that a lot of evolution occurs between groups, and groups do better when they have a lot of internal generosity, a lot of internal helping activity. Uh, group A will outdo group B because of that kind of development. And so from a Darwinian perspective, the idea that somehow compassion and care would be associated with joy, with oxytocin, with even better immune uh, chemical strength, uh, these kinds of things are perfectly plausible from a Darwinian uh, point of view. And then finally, uh, well, this is the book, The Hidden Gifts of Helping, and it's uh, a little bit based on a collection of things I did with Oxford Press a few years ago, just uh, 30 scientific articles by researchers around the country, all of them looking at this relationship between giving and health. Uh, so, those are my comments, uh, and I thank you for your time, and I think Lynn, you wanted to have some conversation. I went a little long.